Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of Patterson in Pursuit. I am your host, Steve Patterson, and we officially begin the Socratic journey in upstate New York. If you follow my work for a while, you know that I'm not the biggest fan of academia, to say the least. I had a very underwhelming college experience. The reason is because nobody seemed to care about big ideas. The students didn't care, the professors didn't care, the administration didn't care. However, there are always some exceptions. And at Alfred University, which is where I got my degree in upstate New York, one of the exceptions was a guy named Dr. Imris Westacott. In terms of our philosophies, when I was getting my undergraduate education, Dr. Westacott's philosophy was the exact opposite of mine. He was a relativist socialist, and I was a rationalist libertarian. But we always got along great. He's always been super respectful. I've always enjoyed conversations with him. He's very well-spoken. He's a great writer. And he's also got a killer British accent, which helps when you're listening to philosophy to have something that makes the experience a little bit more entertaining. And I figured it'd be perfectly appropriate to start the Socratic journey interviewing somebody who believes the opposite of you. The conversation was so good that the interview lasted over an hour. It was like a half an hour on objective truth. And then the second half hour, we talked about the philosophy of mind. But I thought, you know, I'm releasing this new series, and I just don't think it's a good idea to have the first interview be this block of one hour that everybody's got to sit down and listen to. So I've split it up. Episode two, we're going to be talking about objective truth. And then the next episode, episode three is when Dr. Westcott and I talk about the philosophy of mind. So make sure once you're done with this, if you still have an appetite for more philosophy, check out that next episode. All right, so that's enough preface. I hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Emrys Westcott, who is the professor of philosophy at Alfred University. So first of all, Dr. Westcott, thank you very much for sitting down and speaking with me today. You're welcome. This interview is going to be kind of the beginning of a series of interviews I'm going to be doing across the world. And I figure it would be most appropriate if I start at my alma mater, Alfred University. And I figure it also would be appropriate as if what we could talk about is what I consider to be a fairly central question, maybe even the central question or central starting point, and that's about the question of objective truth. So in your own worldview, in your own philosophy, do you think that there is such a thing as objective truth or in your mind, is everything ultimately subjective? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't, I don't think everything is ultimately subjective. I mean, if you jump out of a sky skyscraper, you'll plummet to your death. It's not subjective. You'll stop thinking, lose consciousness. And, uh, you know, and so, um, I, you know, I, I do think there is such a thing as objective reality. And in a sense, I do think there's such a thing as objective truth. I certainly think that the concept of objective truth is one that we pretty much can't live without. Um, in the same way, I, I actually don't think we can really live without the concept of free will, because people can't get through life without assuming that their actions are to some extent under their control. And you can't get through life without constantly exchanging information with people on the assumption that statements can be true or false. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the everyday level, at the level of everyday discourse, is there a mug on the table? Sure, there's a mug on the table. You know, is, are there clouds in the sky? Yes, there are clouds in the sky. Um, at that level, I have no problem. I, I think um, my view of truth is pretty conventional and, and uncontroversial. It's just straightforward correspondence theory of truth. Uh, statements are true when they correspond to reality, when they describe it accurately. But that's fine at the level of everyday discourse. It's not so good at, at a deeper philosophical level, because then the philosopher asks, okay, how do we decide whether a statement corresponds to reality, accurately describes it? And then you immediately have to say, well, we have certain criteria. We use epistemic norms, such as coherence with our other beliefs, the evidence of our senses, the belief that we are not dreaming, the belief that our senses are working. And uh, even even to some extent, things like uh, simplicity, all things being equal, simple theories are supposed to be better. That's Occam's razor. Or even aesthetic criteria. Even Einstein argued that sometimes the beauty of a theory might be an argument in its favor. Um, and so we then say, OK, we work with these criteria. How do we know that the criteria we're working with are the best ones? Because there are, there are rival criteria. For instance, I say, the world is more than 6,000 years old. Some people say, no, it's not. I say, what's your evidence? They say, 
according to the Bible, the world is less than 6,000 years old. One of their norms, one of their epistemic norms is coherence with the Bible. If something doesn't cohere with the Bible in their view, then it can't be true. But that's not one of my epistemic norms. Now, how do I argue with that person? How do I say my epistemic norms are better than yours? Ultimately, and this is where my view is probably um, a minority view, ultimately, I think there's a point where your spade is turned, where you can't demonstrate with a conclusive argument that your epistemic norms are better than someone else's. And the reason you can't is because every argument requires premises. A person, you can only demonstrate something if you have agreed upon premises. I can't demonstrate to someone who's absolutely convinced that the biblical norm is the right one to use, that it's the wrong one to use. What I can do is I can, I can try to make my point of view persuasive. I can say, for instance, if you go with my epistemic norms, you'll be able to make better predictions about the way the world works. You, it will be fruitful. You'll be happier. You'll live um, more productively. I, c I can make these appeals, but um, they're not conclusive, absolute mathematical demonstrations. They're just a, they're kind of pragmatic appeals. So would you say then that you reject the idea of there being any kind of ultimate epistemological foundation that everybody can agree on and say, now these are the, the certain truths that are objective, and if you disagree, the, your epistemic foundation is just objectively flawed? Um, I think this, that one issue is, is there a set of epistemic norms or you know, criteria of truth that human beings might eventually all agree on. Mm -hmm. Now, it's possible there is. It's possible that in several centuries' time, humanity will converge on a set of epistemic norms. Probably, if, if that happens, it would probably be pretty close to what we think of as scientific criteria of truth. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, we might like to think that in several centuries, humanity will converge on a set of epistemic norms pretty much like something like the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights or something like that. We're obviously a long way off that at the moment. But even, here's the philosophical point, supposing it did happen, supposing humanity converged and there was, you know, among the 10 billion people on Earth, there was unanimous agreement about what the correct criteria of truth were. That doesn't prove that those criteria really are giving you the truth. Now, a term that you keep using is epistemic norms, and I think in, in phrasing it that way, it kind of implies that there's, um, that social convention is what determines um, epistemic uh, methodology or something like that. Uh, what if we change that? If I were to say, well, there are certainly epistemic norms in terms of describing how people come to arrive at their conclusions. The Bible is a great example, and religious communities you could say accurately so that in, within religious communities they have these certain set of criteria and then that's why they believe what they do. And from my own perspective, this is the case, wouldn't you say those criteria are objectively flawed to arrive at known conclusions? So if, if I have a, this is an, an example that I love to give. If you have a dartboard and you put a bunch of um, propositions on the dartboard and the cat is sitting on, there's a cat sitting on a chair and it is raining right now and so on and then you throw a dart at a dartboard and you believe that wherever the dart lands, that proposition is true. Now, it might be true to say descriptively some people might have those epistemic um, norms, but couldn't you pretty confidently say that's not a sound way to arrive at, at true beliefs about the world? Um, you, could, you could, and I do believe that. I mean, in the sense that I'm, I tend to be on the side of science against religion. I tend to think that the scientific method is much more likely to give you, for instance, accurate predictions and, and precise descriptions than are any kind of religious criteria. But um, the fact that I think that doesn't, isn't the same as thinking that I can absolutely conclusively prove to my opponent that I'm right and they're wrong. Well, so what if that's not one of the... Um one of the criteria that you care about is proving to the other person. What if it's just proving to your own internal knowledge? So I would say, well, I know that they're wrong. They're never going to know that they're wrong, but I'm okay with that result. Right. And, but then what's left of your original question there when you said, okay, do I believe in objective truth? 
right? And in, in a kind of mundane sense, yes. But then in that deeper philosophical sense, I'm saying, I, okay, I believe that there are criteria which will lead me to beliefs which are very useful for coping with the world. There are people who don't share those criteria. They're just benighted fools. <laughs> um, but according to traditional, you know, sort of philosophy, shouldn't I, doesn't it say something if I can't actually prove my point to them, if all I can say is they're fools? Uh, well, again, I, can, I think I'll take the, the counterpoint, which is my own belief, that, that yes, if that's the conclusion, that there are inferior and superior ways to playing chess, that you can conclusively demonstrate if you have these certain criteria that you think you understand how the game of chess works, you're wrong. And I can demonstrate, at least to my own satisfaction, if, if I get the person in checkmate and they don't realize they're in checkmate, well, that, that's their problem. Right. Excellent example, right? I can work with it. Because one criteria for the best strategy in chess is if it leads to you checkmating the opponent. But it's not the only criterion. You could, for instance, say, you know, that's a pretty philistine, kind of boorish kind of criterion. What I want to see is I want to see beautiful chess being played. And I would much sooner lose playing beautiful chess than win with your methods. But what if they disagree on that final state? The one person, so, so there is such a position on the chessboard that is checkmate. And they say, I'm not in it. And, and, I, and I say, you're certainly in it. Couldn't I then just kind of say, well... then well, there's a, there's a, there is a total... Uh, I guess then you have to just go to the definitions, like in this case, the definition of what is checkmate in chess, and perhaps yeah. what we're talking about, the definition of truth. So what if they agree on the definition? So we have a shared definition, you know, your king's in check and it can't go anywhere. And they, and they look at the board and they just say, nope, I'm not in it. And <laughs> you can see, you yeah. certainly are in it. Then, um, I don't know, uh, I, I, I see the point there. I see the point because on the one hand, your spade is definitely turned, like you just have a straight disagreement and I don't see how you're going to be able to persuade them I, but but at the same time it's impossible for you not to say at that point look I'm right and you're a fool <laughs> right. yes but couldn't that be a, a legitimate conclusion yeah it could in that case what about what about what but it falls other... short of being able to demonstrate to someone who that's true but what if we don't care about that so what if what if so what if my my interest in chess is about discovering truth on the chessboard. It's like, I know that this is the case. And if everybody on, uh, on earth says, no, this person isn't in checkmate, it doesn't matter, they're all wrong. I think I, 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 um, I'm going to agree with you. Can possibly my agreeing with you now might be, might be inconsistent with something I've said earlier, but I think you're right there. An analogy, it would be a bit like, um, like if you know we were arguing about something like racism or something like that, and again, you come to a, absolute loggerheads where someone is just going to absolutely insist that some group of human we think of as human beings are subhuman and you present them with DNA evidence and they just don't budge they at some point say well I think there's no point in us arguing anymore mm -hmm. we, and then you you quite rightly say and does that matter I mean the fact that they are they simply won't accept what you're saying and the fact that from your point of view what they're saying is kind of stupid I mean does it matter? Uh, there are stupid people in the world. There are people who are so dogmatic as to be blind. It's true, but even then, you're, I think you're coming at this still from a very social perspective, that part of dialogue and is, is persuasion. So what I'm trying to get at is just from the, the lone philosopher's point of view, that can you say confidently in some circumstances, regardless of my ability to persuade anybody, Regardless of how many people disagree with this proposition, it is objectively wrong, and I am objectively right. Um, I think that, um, again, in ordinary life, we absolutely um, almost can't avoid taking that view. Whether I'm comfortable taking that view when it comes to, you know, to the ultimate justification of a philosophical proposition, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I think a few years ago, I would I would have sort of said no. I, I think you know, I basically, I was died in the world relativist, and I, th I remember that. <laughs> and I, I think I still am in a, in a way, but only in the sense that, in that limited sense, where I think there's um, you just have to accept that you can't always demonstrate 
to for, you can't demonstrate that what you say is true is true as it were from a god's eye point of view from the standpoint of the universe or something like that can i run some propositions by you yeah. let's well, let's start with the, the most intuitively appealing ones strictly logically airtight propositions like in no part in the universe is there a square circle could we say that is something that from from a god's eye point of view what we mean by the terms means it's a impossibility right um i'm i'm torn right <laughs> and the reason I'm, t I'm torn because on the one hand you know i was thoroughly educated in analytic philosophy an analytic truth is one that's basically true by definition it's opposite it's contradiction um, there are no square circles is basically an analytic truth on the other hand i've also you know read uh, philosophers like willard van Omen quine who argues that the analytic synthetic distinction is not as absolute as people think and actually it's a, there's a spectrum of um, if you want of necessity or certainty uh, ranging from you know the the basic laws of logic at the you know all the way out to highly you know dubious propositions about sense perception and his metaphor is that this forms a kind of a web of belief like a spider's web it's very easy to to jettison one of the beliefs at the periphery without affecting the web but it's very difficult to jettison one of the beliefs at the center without tearing the whole thing apart that's why those beliefs at the center are pretty locked in every so often in the history of science and philosophy you do get an overturning of a central belief like when einstein overturned newton's uh, basic principles and and, uh, and the web does get torn apart a little bit so i'm torn because because uh, I sort of I see the strength of, of both views, the the spectrum view, and but also the you know the just the simple kind of kind of how can you have a square circle, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? So I, I kind of uh, you know for all the, here's the thing from a pragmatic point of view, and there's a good part of me is steeped in Richard Rorty's pragmatism, William James's pragmatism. From a pragmatic point of view, absolutely you can't have a square circle. I mean the, it's. But again, you notice it's pragmatism we're talking. It's not Cartesian certainty or anything like that. It's just that this is a belief, right, like any other analytic or logical belief or something, which is just part of the very scaffolding of our worldview. And um, it's really hard to imagine doing without it. But there's a difference in saying this is a belief that is central in our worldview versus this is a proposition that certainly describes reality a particular way. So what I'm interested in is in the, in the most extreme of all these cases where we're claiming certainty, a, a certain proposition about the nature of reality. And maybe, so, okay, so to avoid the analytic synthetic distinction, let's take another proposition which I consider to be certain. That perception, the phenomena of perception, is something that is certainly happening. It's kind of a play on Koji to or right, right. Sun, but yeah. I, you don't have to say, well, what am I? What is a self? It's Subjective just... Subjective experience is going on. Yes. Right. Is that not absolutely certain? Yeah. And even I, a metaphysical I think, claim. I think so. Yeah, I think, I think it is. But, and do you think that's a claim about what it, something that is happening in the universe, not just about our worldviews? Yeah, I do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that sounds like a foundational, like a foundationalist perspective. Well, um... Couldn't that I, then I be the... I don't know if I want to call it foundationalist in the sense that I'm quite willing. I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely, you know, I've taught intro to philosophy in Descartes often enough and I've thought about it often enough to say, no, absolutely, I, I just don't see any way in which you can't, you, you could avoid saying, um, my subjective experience now is a reality, it's happening. Um, and, uh, but... Is that, that from a God's that, that, Go ahead. that doesn't mean it's a foundation. That doesn't mean that that is the foundation of a, a systematic edifice of knowledge. Wouldn't it, couldn't it couldn't it be though? I mean, wouldn't we want to choose some absolutely certain premise to to go from there? Um, I don't know because Descartes' dream, of course, was that the certainty that attaches to that, to, you know, the cogito, extends through the entire system. Whereas my view is that um, philosophers, under the pernicious influence of Descartes, have obsessed far too much about certainty. I'm pretty happy a lot of the time with with um, philosophical truths that are 
mere generalizations, probabilities, plausibilities, that kind of thing, they can still be insightful, they can still be interesting, they can still be useful. Would you agree with a claim like this, this is uh, again part of my own epistemology, that there are certain truths which build a kind of framework, a kind of certain framework that we can start, so in metaphysics it might be that the, the foundational idea is that subjective experience is happening. And all the other ones are perhaps dependent, but that one you know is happening. And something like uh, in logic, I view logic and logical necessity to be kind of the ultimate bedrock foundation on which even experience couldn't be happening were it not the case that experience is happening, which implies some kind of logical identity that, that permeates everything. But those don't get you very far. So you have this lo that certain logical framework, and then you kind of fill in the details with less certain ideas. What do you think about that idea? Like the um, existence of the external I'd world say, and everything. Fine. I mean, but of course, you know, we're trafficking in metaphors here, aren't we? We talk about a framework. I mean, and uh, having certain beliefs constitute a foundation for the system of knowledge is one metaphor. Having them constitute the scaffolding or framework mm -hmm. is another metaphor. And I guess um, I'd have to see, you know, one would have to see how the whole thing looked in a way. Because I'm quite content to say something like, um, you know, the belief in, you know, or not the belief, the, the, the proposition that subjective experience is happening now. Yeah, that's absolutely certain. Um, and I'm inclined to say that on the one hand, yeah, that's interesting. On the other hand, so what? I mean, how does that, when it comes to, when, how, does, how does that affect the certainty of, you know, ordinary empirical beliefs or scientific theories. Well, would you say then, if you agree with that proposition, then aren't you also implying that the mind has some kind of access to a God's eye universal perspective that you're saying, in the universe there is such a phenomena as subjective experience and I certainly know that it is taking place. And anybody who disagrees with me is certainly wrong. Um. I mean, I see what you're saying there. Uh, the funny thing is that you're saying because you are a subject of experience and acutely aware of the fact that you are a subject of experience, having experiences, you therefore, when you, when you make that claim, when, when you state that, then in a sense it's a claim that is true from the standpoint of the universe, right? It, it's, what yeah. I, I call this, I, uh, this uh, I call this the objectivity of subjectivity. Right. That there is, if something is certainly true, even if it's subjective yeah. from our perspective, you can still make an objective claim about yeah. it happening in the universe. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the way I define objectivity, the way I think of objectivity is, generally speaking, even in common parlance, even at the level of ordinary empirical knowledge, a belief, a claim, a claim is objectively true if it's true independently of our beliefs, wishes, or intentions, right? It, it's, it's, you know, or a will. It's just, in, if it's true independently of anything that we um, think. Now, the, the, the reason, so I'm quite, quite willing to agree in, in, in a, of course, in a sense, the, the, the truth of subjective experience can't be independent of subjective experience, but still, in a sense, mm -hmm. it is, yeah, because I'm not, you know, it isn't dependent on uh, my belief that I'm having these experiences. Um, however, when it comes to, you know, again, the philosophical point of view regarding knowledge in general. I mean, I've, I, by nature, I'm, I'm inclined towards a kind of anti-realist sort of pragmatist position where any description of the world that we give is going to be description using our language, yes. our concepts, our theories, our belief systems, and to quote William James again, he says the the trail of the human serpent is over everything, right? You know, and um, you you can't describe the world except from a human point of view. The, this pers this philosophical perspective, it's the one that's you know pioneered really by Kant. It's shared by a lot you know a lot of philosophers today. Hilary Putnam, who recently died, and Richard Rorty, and William James, and, and many others. It, it's basically saying that. Um, you can you can think you can form the concept of reality as it is independent of human experience, but you never can actually describe a reality independent of human experience. The only reality we know is the one that we experience, and the only way we can describe it is using our cognitive apparatus and our you know our concepts. And therefore, 
that reality that we describe and when and when we describe it accu- as we think accurately we say these statements are objectively true they're objectively true within a certain kind of I want to say, within a certain relationship we can't ever sort of see our relation to the world sideways on i can so i think for the majority of propositions that's the case that we kind of can't escape the the framing of our own concepts but couldn't somebody say that uh, the word experience or the word perception is a, a visual representation of a concept so we have the, like the, the word relates to the concept of perception what i mean by that but what i mean by that concept and what i mean by that word is something that is in the world like it has an objective referent it's not that is something that is out there that i'm saying oh well that is happening you know what's the objective referent what what's an example of what you're talking about the phenomena of experience or the phenomena of perception that that right. thing is a thing that is out there and i'm just describing it with certain words and certain concepts but even if i were mute and even if i couldn't conceptualize that phenomena would still be taking place or happening um yeah it would uh it would be um you could say something's going on yeah <laughs> <laughs> right but i mean yeah, i keep quoting william james william james says you know that i think it's william james who, who, who says without you know the conceptual ordering of what comes in through the senses all we'd be having is a, a blooming buzzing confusion kant says that without the conceptual ordering of the what he calls the manifold of intuition again the what comes in through the senses he says it, it would be um it would be less even than a dream it would just be a, a it would be without the order that the mind puts puts on it uh you couldn't really describe it but you you could try and, i guess you could say something's happening yeah but even so let let's take this kind of uh, silly example which i think is the god's eye perspective i think it is this sideways um perspective where we we have access to the subjective and we seem to have access to the objective because we can make claims about the subjective with certainty so for example if it were impossible for us to conceptualize and use language to describe the phen- phenomena of experience like imagine a world where it was that phenomena was still taking place what i'm referencing now is still taking place but we can't talk about it and we can't conceptualize couldn't we say like from our perspective in that alternative universe all of the beings that inhabit it uh, inhabit it though they they don't understand what's going on it's still taking place yeah. So doesn't that is then is that necessarily from that from that grand perspective I mean that, that seems yeah. like it's inescapable Well I suppose I mean I mean except that why why sort of posit some some other beings that are having their experiences which is what you seem to be doing there Yeah you could do that with with your yeah. own too yeah But you could do it with your own and, and cuz that's where you were originally and right, and, right. and that's the the indubitability of subjective experience which right. I I kind of accept um yeah i mean i'll sort of accept that that um and again it, it's a kind of cartesian point in a way that i accept the indubitability of subjective experience and therefore in a sense that from the standpoint of the universe from the god's eye point of view something's going on <laughs> <laughs> there is something rather than nothing that's very <laughs> exciting to, 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 to yeah, th- it's does... a start but but <laughs> but then the question is that, that whereas descartes thinks he can then construct his log cabin you know i kind of i'm a bit more inclined to say yeah i mean there are um, there are claims and beliefs that we can s- assert with greater or lesser certainty great and and here we're talking about the beliefs that we can assert with the great you know the greatest degree of certainty it doesn't follow that the whole that that certainty percolates upwards i mean it, so let me ask you a couple of other questions then or I'll make make a couple more propositions something is happening we can agree that yes something is happening and even we have some kind of understanding that that something is perception or subjective experience as we reference it how about something like this that Dr. Imrus Westacott what I'm referencing by that term does not know everything that there is to know in the universe there is some knowledge there's some information that you don't possess 
Is that something that now I can't know that because maybe you know everything? Is that something that you can know with with certainty? I suppose, yeah. I mean, well, uh, that's that's step two. Now, now we have, look, we have practically a, a fleshed out worldview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so it's, something's going on, and it's not everything. <laughs> yeah, and uh, well, so so if that if what I said is true, then that implies that the something that's going on is something that is conceptualizing things, even if inaccurately so, you're still conceptualizing things. And we can even have certainty in describing the knowledge that that thing possesses or doesn't possess about the world. Right? I mean, that seems like we're getting into med- like certain metaphysical statements. Well, I mean, so far we've only got something's going on and I don't know everything. I mean... Well, yes, but that imply, well, that seems like that, if that's true, if that's certainly true, then it implies something about uh, what th- the mind is. I think it, it, it's this, it is this experiencing thing that holds beliefs, certainly. And if that's yeah. the case, I, I think other things, I don't know all the implications yeah. of that, but that, that seems like that might kind of start the snowball effect of, of, of the Descartes. <laughs> <laughs> it could. Of course, you have to be careful because, because I mean, uh, you know, Descartes said, of course, I think therefore I am, and people have criticized that, saying he's, he's not entitled to use this word I, for right. instance, very, very controversial concept. And even there, where, where I, I, I uh, sort of rather loosely said, oh, I don't know everything, but re- really, it's something's going on, and the something's going on it does not constitute knowledge of everything, right. would be a bit more neutral. Right. Than that. Because, because it, it, it is true, once you start talking about selves, um, then you know. Then you've got some work to do, to specify exactly what you're referring to by that that term. Well, I would absolutely love to talk to you about that. All right, so that's where we've got to end the interview for this episode. We started transitioning to talk about the metaphysics of mind, which is a fantastic conversation and a fantastic topic. And if you want to hear that conversation, make sure to check out episode three where we complete our conversation. I'm very grateful that Dr. Westicott got to speak with me. I sincerely recommend a book that he co-authored. It's called Thinking Through Philosophy, and it's a basic introduction to philosophy. He co-authored it. And you'll see what I'm saying about him being an actually clear-headed, clear writing philosopher, which is kind of a rarity nowadays. I'll have a link to it on the show notes page at steve-patterson.com slash two. So if you like this interview, then make sure to subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm going to be releasing a new podcast every single week. And if this interview created value for you, if you value it one dollar or more, then I'm asking for your support to make this series last as long as possible up front. One of the beautiful things about the internet is that it keeps cutting out middlemen. So producers of content can produce directly to their consumers, and consumers can give back directly to the producers of content that they value. And I'm working with a company called Patreon right now, which allows people to automatically chip in $1 when I post new content like this. So if you want to support the show, make sure to head over to patreon.com slash Steve Patterson. Plus, if you become a patron, you'll also get a free copy of all the books that I've written and every book that I intend to write in the future. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did.